Hey gang, we are back at it, and today I'm at St. Joseph's Cemetery. We actually last year did an episode on the real story of the exorcist, but today I'm going to tell you the real story of a very sad story of an airship crash that happened in 1919, a dirigible that crashed downtown Chicago. I want to thank Sue Gerling, one of our viewers and subscribers, for pointing this story out, reminding me of it. And as I tell the story, actually, we're going to look at some graves on the way. There are some pictures here, so uh, we'll look at a few of those, and then I will tell the story. And here is one to start with, a family plot marker with only one name on it for Maria. And it, I'm pretty sure that Maria was German because down below it says Mutter and Maria passed in 1934. She was born in 1908 so fairly young. Let's mosey over this way. It's a child here, Pauline Lowe. Beautiful child. Pauline was born in 1918 and passed in 1926. Could have been a multitude of diseases, including the Spanish flu, which really started around 1918, but it was still around. So many diseases took so many children out in those days, from typhus to diphtheria to typhoid all those terrible diseases. This here is Elizabeth who passed in 1927. 1862 to 1927. And here it looks like there are two sisters, Irene and Catherine. Irene will step over on this side. Now what's interesting is Irene was the youngest, born May 4th, 1913. Her sister Catherine, born, uh, what, four years or so earlier. And what's interesting is both of these girls died within, well, it looks like four days. Irene passed June 17, 1925, and Catherine passed, I'm going to reach over here, June 21st, 1925. I wonder what happened. Hmm. Rest in peace. Oh, here's another picture. Another sister, it looks like, who was born in 1891. Now let's think about this. 1891. And maybe that's her mom. Yeah. I think this would be the mother. Right, Elizabeth? And ironically, she died around the same time. June 16th, same time of year, in 1925. Let's check this here. Oh boy. They all died, two daughters and mom, if, if I'm right, if this is the mother, they all died within a few days of each other. So mom died on June 16th, right? And then the next day Irene died and then just a few days, four days later, Catherine died. Holy cow. Well, if I can figure out what happened with Deb, our ancestry expert, I will post something right here, right now. And if we can't figure it out, well, you're not seeing anything on the screen right now. Let's continue on.
There's a couple here. So a very sad story, this airship crash that happened back in July of 1919. It was actually on Monday, July 21st of 1919. And it was up above in the air, of course, flying downtown Chicago. It was owned and operated by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Yes, they were flying those blimps even back then. And they were taking people from the Grant Park area back and forth to the White City Amusement Park. Now the White City, well you remember the White City, the Columbian Exposition that happened in the uh, late 1800s. So the White City Amusement Park was on the south side, I think Woodlawn neighborhood, and it was like the biggest amusement park in the country. And they actually assembled the blimp there and they would take people back and forth from there to over the loop. We call it the loop. That's the center of downtown Chicago. And they would take them to Grant Park and, you know, sightseeing. And on that fateful day, there was a, there was a huge problem, obviously, at the worst possible time. It was 4.55 p.m. in the evening and people down below were getting ready to get, you know, they were getting off work, wrapping up. And at the Illinois Trust and Savings Bank building, there were 150 employees that were closing for the day. And many of which were working in the main banking hall. They had one of these large skylights that some of the banks of the day had. There's beautiful atrium, if you will, in the center, the big hall, and all was well. And everyone was coming out on LaSalle Street and wrapping up the day. Now, here is the grave and plot marker looks like for a father and son. Fred Sr. and his son David, I'm gonna believe. Harley Davidson riders, no doubt. Fred died in 2000. And his son David passed just three years later. Very sad. And it says, gone on a long ride. A long motorcycle ride. I see Grand Manier. They must have liked Grand Manier. So everything was happy and people started looking up from the streets below and all of a sudden there was an explosion and the, the whole thing just started coming apart. If you've seen footage of the Hindenburg, it was probably very similar to that. And if you look at the pictures, it looks like that. And that ship just came tumbling down from the sky in a ball of molten steel and burning fabric. It was horrendous. People were screaming up and down the streets, looking up in horror. And when it became clear that the dirigible was failing, pilot Jack Boatner and his chief mechanic, Harry Wacker, not sure if he's related to the famous Wacker family in Chicago, but they had parachutes and they were the only survivors, I believe. They jumped to safety, but it has to be noted here that Jack did the proper thing. He briefed all the passengers Everyone had parachutes, and the parachutes actually had, it showed how to hook the ropes up to the gondola, and so, you know, he said, all you have to do is jump, and don't worry about anything else. 
Well, it didn't quite work out that way, sadly, for everybody else. A second mechanic, Carl Alfred Weaver, died when his parachute caught fire, and passenger Earl H. Davenport, who was a publicity agent for the White City Amusement Park itself, he had been begging the pilot for a long time for that long-promised ride, and today was his day, but unfortunately, Mr. Davenport's parachute got tangled in the cables, the cables that were suspended from the gondola from the envelope, leaving him hanging 50 feet below. Now Davenport's hanging there, struggling. Can you imagine? Grabbing, what can he do? He's 50 feet below the, this big burning on fire blimp and it goes crashing down. Of course, he was crushed under the molten steel as soon as it hit the ground. And there were others. There were others, including another one begging to get on, Chicago Daily News photographer Milton Norton. He had made it, he broke both his legs on landing, but he later died in the hospital. And of course, directly below the sad location of where the ship crashed was that location I was describing of the Illinois Trust and Savings Bank, the building where they were in the process of getting things wrapped up and down came the disintegrating ship right into the center of that beautiful skylight atrium and that hot pile of burning fabric and molten metal just crashed through down debris falling all through it was horrific in addition to those stuck on the airship there were 10 additional employees killed on the ground with 27 more injured. Now there are three boys, well I should say there was a 30 year old young man. They were messengers and one was a bank clerk teller and they were they were part of the they were part of the people a group of people that were killed and we're gonna visit their graves today and we're gonna start with Jacob Carpenter and this marker is the family plot for the Carpenter family right here and I can see his parents name already Paul and Magdalene right here I do not see a, I don't see anything for Jacob. And we'll check the back side. But it does not look, I don't see a ground stone or I don't see anything for him. The stone back here, those are other, other people. Hmm. We're gonna contact the archdiocese and we're going to see if we can get his name carved on there. That is only right. I'm sure the stone was, well, the stone was not here. None of this was here when he was buried. His parents may not have had the money for a, a tombstone or a gravestone. And, of course, they died. Paul in 1937, Magdalene in 1949 was when uh, 37 is probably when this stone went up. Not sure why Jacob is, did not get marking or a stone, but we'll find out. He was born in Chicago about 1902, and he was 17 years old. He was a bank messenger at the Illinois Trust and Savings Bank, so not a lot else that I could find on him, but we'll see what we can do. 
on finding, well, making sure that he is, he is here, and then if we do, we'll see if we can get a stone for him, or at the very least, we'll try to get a marking. Okay, we're going to head now to, we're going to go to the south side to the Olivet Cemetery down there. There's a couple cemeteries where the other two boys are, that one and the one across the street, so we'll meet you down there. Mount Greenwood Cemetery now on the south side of Chicago and we're going to the grave of Joseph Scanlon. It's a beautiful cemetery here and I was told that he was near the Babcock family plot which I have found over here right up here And as I scan the stones, looking at last names, we see the Babcocks, and we see the Scanlons right here. I see William, father, 1858 to 1918. So he passed away just over a year before the disaster. But his mom passed away in 1930, Margaret Scanlon, April 14th, 1930. And here I see Joe D. Joe Scanlon. Let's see, I'm going to step between these. Quite a mess here of weeds. There we go. Okay, it's a little better. Joe D. Scanlon, June 27th, 1905, July 21st, of course, 1919, died serving. And at the top of the stone it says son. As the others say mother, father. Well, I'll bring up a picture of Joe. Joseph, he was only 14 years old, and he was a messenger. He was a messenger for the bank. Beautiful child. He he uh, he died at 14. I couldn't really find anything else about him, but I'm sure he was a good boy. Rest in peace, Joe, and rest in peace to the Scanlon family. And we're gonna we're gonna head across the street right now to Mount Olivet to uh, wrap things up. We are at Mount Olivet Cemetery, just across the street to the south of where Joe. Joseph Scanlon 
is buried. We saw his grave. And our last stop is going to be here at the Calopy family, at their family plot. You can see here a beautiful marble stone for them. And yes, there is the inscription of Marcus and the infamous date of 19, 1919, right here. Below you see, that's his wife, Emily's inscription, who passed away in 1955. And we see the inscription of the parents, Catherine, who passed away in 1941. In July, actually, it was just five months before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and World War II started for America, the entry, and then Thomas in 1917. Thomas came from Ireland and married Catherine. Catherine was from Indiana and the family, the children were born in Indiana, Marcus and his, I don't know if he had any uh, sisters or brothers, but he was born in Indiana. But I do know that he had four children and one of those children, they were all women, Mary Rita Callipy Anderson, was born December 4th, 1913, and she passed in 2002 at the age of 88. Her body was donated to medical science. Sister Ann Stephanie Callipy, the sister who was born in 1915, became a nun and she died at the age of 92 in 2008. She is buried at Adrian Dominican Sister Cemetery, Adrian, Michigan. You wonder if this event had affected Aunt Stephanie. Carol Callipy Gallagher, who was born July 29th, 1917, died at the age of 52. She died young in 1970 on June 9th. And lastly, Marcella, Marcella A. Waklowek, who was born August of 1919 on the 25th. She passed in 1999 in December at the age of 80. So a, a big family here. And I'm guessing there are grandchildren Hopefully they're all in good health, but that generation of Marcus and Emily and their children, as well as their parents, have all passed. Well, there was an article written, there were several article, articles written about the accident, and many included Marcus. There was one that was it told a little bit about Marcus, and I'll read you part of it. It said, everyone knew him as Mark, Mark Callipy, and that is the name by which he will long be remembered. Mark was a teller and a splendid worker too. He was in the foreign department, having been transferred to that position after long experience in the savings department. He came with the bank in September, September 1st, of 1911. Most members of the bank knew Mark and he was a mighty capable man. He was quiet, he was unassuming, unassuming in manner as well as faithful and diligent in his work. On that fateful day it is said that he had left his cage and had gone to another department, of course, a department that was located right under that skylight. And he went to add a postscript to a letter, one of his letters, and that is when the blimp came crashing through the skylight, bringing death to those all around him and injuries which claimed Mark's life a few days later. He leaves a wife and children May they feel the great sympathy which goes out to them 
from the hearts of Mark's many friends in the bank. A very sad story all the way around. And we're going to wrap it up here at the Calopy family plot. And we wish the entire Calopy family, we're hoping they're resting in peace, and to all the victims of the Wingfoot airship disaster, may they all rest in peace.